Welcome to APP to APP virtual lectures. My name is Dr. James Gorman, and this is Intro to Emergency Medicine. I did put a sea turtle up here, which may seem a little odd, but um, I'm a scuba diver, and I really enjoy diving with sea turtles. They're very calm and peaceful and beautiful. They just look wise to me. They live to a long, uh, they live a long life. And I want you to have a long life in the emergency department, and I want you to have a good time in the emergency department. I'm hoping that uh, some of the tools that we'll give you in this lecture here will will help in that uh, cause. Um, I think it's good to keep a very calm uh, vibe about yourself in the ER. Oftentimes, uh, the ER gets crazy, sometimes just because it's super busy. Maybe not that many sick people, but you have tons of people coming in, and you feel that pressure to get people seen, people start getting angry, they're waiting, or you could have some critically ill people and sometimes you have more than one. Um, so your vibe tends to emanate as does anyone's. And as the team leader, you wanna emanate a very peaceful, calm vibe. That'll, that'll help the situation and help yourself too. So with that said, let's go to the first slide. So in the emergency department, you can literally see just about anything in the realm of medicine and sometimes not even the realm of medicine. Um, the other day, in a true story, I had a guy bring his dog in because uh, his dog had uh, uh, mouthed uh, one of our desert toads out here. And these Arizona desert toads have um, a uh, psychedelic dissociative pharmacon in their uh, skin secretions and it makes the dogs very sick. And a guy literally came up, you know, basically asking us, you know, what can we do for his dog or what should he do? So you got that emergency outside your building and uh, people pretty much think anything goes. And most of the time it does. Um, at this point, I've been practicing 26 years and there's still occasions, not that often, but still occasions that I see something I've never seen before. I always make sure I tell the patient, never seen this, 26 years. But it happens. So that can be a daunting task um, because as you're new in the field and you're thinking, I got to know something about everything. Um, Stuart Saudron, one of the, our great EM lecturers out of USC, always says you need to know um, something about every specialty and then one step further, meaning that you don't have to know everything about every specialty, but you, you got to know the basics and you got to know a little bit more than the basics about every specialty. So that can be a daunting task. Um, the truth is that no one's going to call you out if you miss the Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome. But if you send somebody home with a hemoglobin of four, uh, you're probably going to hear about that. And the person's probably not going to do well. So how do we avoid that? Uh, next slide, please. So in the typical emergency room, you're going to see largely benign conditions. It's just a fact. Um, when we go into it, we all think it's going to be all excitement all the time, but we do see a lot of mundane things. Um, acuity levels in most ERs range from 5 to 30 percent. Uh, that's a rough figure. My statistics for this lecture are not hard statistics taken from literature. They're just ballpark figures to give you an idea. Um, the majority of, of uh, ER acuity is um, is uh, 10 to 15 percent for that would be pretty typical. Um, so your majority is around 10 to 15% actually. So that means you're going to send home 90% of your patients. Um, a very small percentage of your patients are going to be truly critically ill, uh, have true critical life and limb threatening uh, illnesses. Um, and uh, you really you just can't miss them. Um, so your, your battle is to maintain a vigilance for serious illness amidst the sea of banality, uh, which is Easier said than done, trust me. Um, it's very easy to get uh, somewhat jaded seeing benign abdominal pain after benign abdominal pain. So with that being said, in the ER, the most common complaint is abdominal pain. And the most common diagnosis for that complaint is abdominal pain, meaning that despite all of our advanced therapeutics and diagnostics and labs and whatnot, we uh, we generally don't, uh, I mean, it's very common not to determine the exact cause of someone's abdominal pain. The same can be said of chest pains. Um, even though we oftentimes diagnose exactly what things are, many, many times we were unable to 
diagnose it at all. Um, so you want to be sure, uh, again, don't quote me on the statistics. I'm just uh, giving you some ballparks. But if you if you have like maybe a thousand patients that you've seen that have uh, appendixes and have abdominal pain, there might be, you know, one to 10 of them that have uh, an actual appendicitis. So you got to you have to maintain that vigilance so that you don't miss those those cases, um, because whatever, you know, 900 and 980 of them aren't going to have appendicitis and maybe 20 do or something of that nature. Um, one thing I like to point out is that people that can burn you are um, substance abusers and psychiatric patients. Um, they often are in there for their chronic illnesses um alcoholics are in there because they're drunk and meth addicts are in there because they're uh they're uh tweaking on, on meth and hallucinating uh your depressed patient is in there for depression but keep in mind uh those people get appendicitis they get subarachnoid hemorrhages they get meningitis uh so you know for example a uh person that's uh, abusing methamphetamine and they're hallucinating what if they have a fever 101? I mean, they could still have meningitis or encephalitis, you know, causing them to hallucinate. It might not be their, their um, substance. And uh, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, a, a good example for that is a case I've probably seen about three cases of aortic dissection in uh, young people, like people in their 30s. You normally wouldn't think that a 30 year old is going to have an aortic dissection. You kind of think that's, you know, 50 or more or something of that nature. Um, but if you throw in stimulant abuse, methamphetamine and cocaine, uh, they actually put those people at a higher risk because of the severe alterations in their blood pressure, like skyrocketing blood pressures, um, along with general ill health. They don't tend to take care of themselves as much because of their addiction. Um, if they have blood pressure problems, which some young people do, they might not be taking their medication and worsening it with the stimulant use. So uh, actually, all three of those cases is kind of funny. I went through the same the same dialectic with myself, uh, which goes back to what I said about maintain that vigilance and a sea of banality. Uh, they'll come in and they're excruciating pain. They're writhing around. Uh, it seems almost like uh, like hysterical. Um, and if you're not seeing that person regularly for pain, which the three that I saw were not regulars, um, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt, get an IV in them quick and give them some Dilaudid, a good slug of Dilaudid. And you notice that like, you know, they're quiet for about 15 minutes and then they're writhing around and screaming for payments. And then you start thinking, oh, this person's just drug seeking, you know, obviously, you know, they're, they're a drug addict. They told me that they take methamphetamine. They probably just want some, some fentanyl or something. And then you notice that their blood pressure is, uh, you know, 200 over 100. Um, and you start, start thinking, well, wait a minute, you have back pain. Most aortic dissections are going to have back pain. And they're typically, the thing that kind of cues you that it's aortic dissection is they have back pain and something else, like back pain and vomiting, back pain and my, my left leg is numb, back pain and both my legs are numb, you know, back pain, I can't feel my left arm, you know, back pain and a headache. You know, uh, most aortic dissection are going to have back pain and something else. So uh, all three of those cases, I went from this guy's out of his mind. You know, I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt to this guy must be drug seeking. You know, I think he's a drug user. He's got track, track marks and whatnot. And then blood pressure. And then, oh, wait a minute. Could this guy have a dissection? I mean, you can't miss that, you know. So luckily for me, I did manage to get from point a to point b like does this guy have a dissection in about an hour which isn't really that bad actually because they're very rare diagnoses but anyhow it just just want to hammer that home that uh substance abusers they get serious medical illnesses and sometimes they're not even aware that they're seriously medically ill they get endocarditis they get uh if they're shooting the drugs they get uh um, osteomyelitis they can get spinal cord abscesses you know, so you have to keep uh, that vigilance, you know, always for these serious illnesses. And it gets hard when you're seeing a lot of, you can go a couple of days sometimes, uh, possibly not see anybody that sick. So you need to maintain that vigilance that, you know, the next one might be. It's hard to do over a long period of time. It really is. Next slide, please. 
So vital signs are vital. Um, I have this picture just to show how old I am, that when I started practicing as an attending, uh, I still had a watch with a second hand on it and, uh, you know, still took people's, uh, you know, a good number of my patients' vital signs myself by feeling the radial pulse and that kind of a thing, taking a manual blood pressure. Now, like most of the patients have, uh, have, have got vital signs documented on the chart. Most of them, if they're sick are on a monitor, so not using the watches so much anymore, but that's just supposed to be a gentleman noticing that somebody's pulse rate is 122 and they're just laying in bed. Uh, next slide, please. So vital signs coming from the Latin root of vitae, meaning life. And we want our patients to live and the pain scale. Like pain, as we were told, it's the fifth vital sign. That came out, I think, about 2000, sometime around then, maybe the late 90s. The pain was the fifth vital sign. Um, probably should have tipped us off that it may not have been the most enlightened uh, concept since, as you notice, we already had five vital signs. So that means pain should have been the sixth vital sign. Um, just wanted to go a bit on about that pain scale because it's still used and probably will be used in perpetuity. Although I'd like to make it my life, um, my life project to extinguish the pain scale from emergency medicine departments all over the world. Um, so that one to 10 pain scale that's asked for all the adult patients, that there's a whole lot of pain scales. You know, you have the, the children pain scale with the, the faces. Um, that one actually works reasonably well for kids. Uh, and you have scales of one to 20, this one to 10 scale had its root in a um, study on angina patients, which we called angina in the 80s, but now called ACS. It was a small cohort of patients they did a study on that were admitted with the diagnosis of unstable angina and at that time placed on a nitroglycerin drip and heparin and managed over a period of days in the ER. And the researchers made some argument that following their pain on a scale of one to 10 would one being the least they could imagine and 10 being the worst pain they could imagine and, and tabulating that and following it through their hospital stay uh, was advantageous to their therapy and their, their overall outcome. But it, that it helped, um, it helped the practitioners uh, properly treat their disease. I don't really know how they proved that or if it was proven very well, but that was the idea. Um, and the Joint Commission and the Center of Medicaid Services took that and ran with it. And this is a good lesson for when you have decision rules like the heart score or the perk rule, um, there's a certain cohort that those decision rules were tested on. And you need to, when you're dealing with research on a cohort, you need to make sure that you're applying it to the same cohort. So the government in its infinite wisdom decided that, well, if it works for unstable angina patients, then we should be able to ask everybody, all comers that walk in the door, whether it's an ankle sprain or headache or unstable angina, your their pain on a scale of one to ten, and then that will that will be very adventitious and all. It'll help the practitioner. It doesn't help at all. It, it doesn't help in the slightest. I mean, number one, almost everybody reports greater than ten, so almost everybody doesn't follow the scale and give you a number. There's many reasons for that. Um, when you do get somebody that says pain of three. You better watch that person, you know, anybody that's, uh, you know, I say under under five, you probably want to be aware of that person, although I wish they would remove it altogether. But if you combine that with the fact that the government told us at that time that short term opiates were not um, addictive, uh, I, I can say without hyperbole that this foolishness um, heavily contributed to the deaths of probably upwards of 20 to 30 million Americans, and it's still ongoing now. Because pain has a, a function. It's not, it's not our enemy. Um, the pain scale does not help us. Opiates are addictive, even in the short term. So this foolishness, I think, is a big, big part, big player in the current opioid epidemic that is probably still the number one cause of death in a youngish uh, age group in America. Um, so just be aware of government mandates. Uh, we're generally required to follow them. I'm not saying don't follow them, but I'm saying understand where they get them from and understand the research. And if it doesn't seem like a good idea to you, uh, then take it with a grain of salt. Just do what you have to do on your chart, but realize that it's probably not helpful. 
Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is just some Northern Lights. Uh, this is probably more for me because whenever I talk about the pain scale, I tend my blood pressure tends to go up. Northern Lights are beautiful. So when you're having those stressful days in the ER or nights in the ER, just remember the world is beautiful, life is beautiful, and the shift will end. Let's go to the next slide. So know your normals. I'm not going to write them down here for you. They're easy enough to look them up. Make sure you know the normal vital signs in different age groups. Obviously, they change uh, depending on how, you know, if we're dealing with an adult or a neonate. So you, just so that you know, as soon as you see it, it jumps out at you as a problem. Like, say, a respiratory rate of 70 in a neonate or a pulse rate of 180 in a neonate or pulse rate of 120 in a 20-year-old. So just make sure you know your normals so that when you look at them, they jump right out at you. Let's go to the next slide. So just, you know, the, the gist of this lecture really is to impress upon you how important the vital signs are, that they will save you from missing things, that you should address them early, immediately. Like the first thing I want to see on a chart is vital signs. Unfortunately, you don't always get them first in the chart. They'll oftentimes get how about a pulse rate of 122? Can you think of any disease processes that present with that? You don't have to answer now. It's just a thought thing. We're going to do a case in a minute. How about a pulse ox of 85%? You know, can you think of anything there? Temperature of 101. I'll tell you, you know, you're just looking at pulse 122. You know, you think about things like anemia, hypoxemia, the 85% pulse ox, pneumonia, you know, some type of VQ mismatch, pulmonary embolism, methane globinemia. Temperature 101, could be some kind of sepsis, could be a endocrine problem, thyroid toxicosis. So let's go to the next slide. Pain, 14 out of 10. I'm just kidding. It's useless. Next slide. Okay, so this is our case presentation. We have a 32-year-old female with chief complaint of chest pain. She looks good in the in the, in the triage. She doesn't look stressed or anything. Uh not toxic looking. Her vital signs are 147 over 95, pulse of 122, respiratory rate of 16, temperature of 98.8, pulse ox 98% of room air. So what is wrong here and how would you go about working it up? Let's go to the next slide. So I, tachycardia, hypertension, afebrile, she's saturating well, respiratory rate normal. Can we get a differential from this? So you know, is this is this uh, is this PE? Is this a pneumothorax? Is this you know uh, atypical pneumonia? Um, just kind of a few things I'd I'd want to be able to rule out PE. Yeah, yeah. The only thing with the PE and is, is that that uh, and, and pneumonias and whatnot is that her, her she's saturating well. Although Don's correct that uh, you know you don't. You can still be saturating well and have pneumonia or have a PE, although it's it's a little bit less likely. Um, so, I mean, that's important because that does help you get to what's actually happening with this patient. This is a, this is a real patient I saw 20 years ago. But, um, yeah, those are some good ideas. Uh, is there anybody else that have any thoughts? I'm wondering whether the rhythm is regular or not. So, we'll find yeah, out in a second. We just know it's tachycardic, uh, uh, a regular rhythm or not. Is it an arrhythmia? Yeah, I, I, thyroid toxosis. Yes. Thyroid always, for, for tachycardia, you always want to keep that in mind. Oftentimes that's forgotten. And we even a, even a stroke is going to give you the vital signs that are hypertensive and tachycardic, you know? Yeah, not 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 always tachycardic, but sometimes, you know, anytime yeah. there's a, anytime your adrenals are working, anytime your body is is stressed, if there's something happening that's uh, you know out of the norm, uh, you, you may get a tachycardia. So let's go to the next slide. This is a differential that I came up with, which is just one person's differential, but it's one way to, to go through this. Um, so as our one of our, uh, one of our attendees mentioned, I didn't catch the name. Uh, I wanna make sure that it's, uh, you know, is it regular? Uh, so, you know, arrhythmias are up there with those vital signs. Um, PSVT, atrial flib, atrial flutter, ventricular tachycardia. As Dom was mentioning, you got your pneumonias, pulmonary embolus, pneumothorax, pneumothorax, COPD, asthma exacerbation. Um, 
again, like the normal saturation kind of points a little bit away from that, although not, it's not a hundred percent. And you got your, your cardiomyopathies, coronary syndromes, cardiogenic shock, the blood pressure is good. So that's already ruled out. Pericarditis, myocarditis, certainly possible. Endocarditis possible. Cardiac tamponade, consider it, but with the normal pressure, that's unlikely. Um, cardiac valve rupture, same thing. Uh, tachycardia, yeah, but not the normal pressure um, and probably not the normal SATs. And then you have your anemias, septicemias, dehydration, um, your acidemias, DKA, acute renal failure, those oftentimes you'll have tachycardia and a little bit of hypertension, normal SATs. So, you know, it could be somebody in acute renal failure or DKA. And as Sharon mentioned, your thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism, thyroid toxicosis, thyroid storm. Um, there's uh, certainly uh, many others, but um, uh, this is a framework to work with. And this is just based on the vital signs without anything else. So when you apply your understanding of the vital signs and this differential, which is a lot of the serious things that you have to make sure they don't have. If you add on, you know, your history and your physical, or just look at, look at that. You know, you already know that like, you can probably rule out tamponade. You can probably rule out um, uh, hemothorax and pneumothorax with a good physical exam, maybe not a hundred percent, but um, asthma CLPD, uh, you just need an EKG to figure out the first box there. Um, and you'll just need lab work to figure out uh, some of these other other boxes there. So it's not anything like, you know, an MR scan or contrast study of the brain. It, you know, it's simple stuff. Vital signs, history, physical. Let's go to the next slide. So this is what I suggest. History, physical. For anybody with these kind of vital signs, anybody that has tachycardia, you want to get an EKG on that. Um, anybody that's that's tachycardic, hypertensive, having chest pain, you're going to get a chest X-ray. If you're handy with bedside ultrasound, you should throw an ultrasound probe on them. You can immediately see things like tamponade, um, pericardial effusion, pneumothorax, pneumonia. Don't even need to wait for an X-ray. So you can narrow that differential down um, considerably. Uh, just with these these uh, these few things. So let's go to the next slide. So as I was saying, an EKG for tachycardia is a good rule. You really don't want to have, I mean, if somebody comes in at 102 and they're down to 80 after you start evaluating them, you probably don't have to worry about it. But someone who's persistently above 100, you probably should get an EKG on all those people um, to rule out any kind of arrhythmia. Uh, for this patient with chest pain and tachycardia hypertension you definitely want a, a chest x-ray you're going to definitely get basic labs now you have to decide whether you want to do a troponin or a d-dimer um if you're doing troponins and low risk chest pain people uh one troponin begets another you should never do a single troponin because a single troponin has not been proven in any literature to to reliably rule anything out so you need two troponins currently for rapid rule outs, the, the, um, the uh, standard is to do a, a troponin, uh, initial troponin and a troponin three hours later. Um, then you, you want to get your, your TSH, as Simon was pointing out. And as I was pointing out, your um, point of care ultrasound is, is uh, definitely going to be, be helpful if you can do it. It'd be something you definitely want to learn, learn how to do. It's starting to replace your stethoscope. There are some doctors in critical care that don't even have stethoscopes anymore. They just have ultrasounds. Um, gives you a lot more information than a stethoscope. So the D-dimer, that's one we'll go over in a bit. Let's go to the next slide. So the PERC rule is something that you need to commit to memory for working in the ER, in my opinion. Um, the PERC rule helps you avoid unnecessary D-dimers. It gets your... Um, probability of pulmonary embolus below 2% just with a negative PERC rule. Uh, so you want to make sure you know how to use that. There's nothing more frustrating than coming on a night shift than the, the day shift practitioner thought they were going to help you out. And they decided to send some D-dimers on the people with chest pain out in the waiting room. And you got three D-dimers that, you know, passed the PERC rule and you sh wouldn't have needed. The problem with that is that uh, you probably are aware the D-dimer is highly sensitive, meaning if you have a pulmonary embolus, it's probably positive. I, I think it's like 98% or greater. 
but it's very nonspecific. I think it's about 50%. So it's like a coin toss. So if you're sending them willy nilly, you're going to get a lot of positives. And if you get a positive D dimer, you're kind of pretty much now on the hook to do a definitive test, which is going to be either a CT angiogram. So CT with contrast of the lungs or a, um, a VQ scan. Uh, and it's possible that you may work in a place that doesn't have nuclear medicine 24 hours a day or even at all. Um, the person could have an allergy to contrast. They might not be able to get an appropriate IV. You need like a 20 gauge in the antecubital or better. And sometimes you can't get those things. Um, they could have severe renal impairment. Uh, there's studies showing that, you know, if you need the CTA, you should do it with the renal impairment anyway. But the radiologist always raise a fuss about that. So the bottom line is if you're sending D-dimers willy-nilly, you're going to give yourself a major headache uh, and your patients and your staff. Um, so being able to cut that D-dimer thing out of the differential with just some questions is, is fantastic. And this is a good point to, to kind of harken back to my inappropriate use of the pain scale by joint commission. <clears throat> um, don't apply uh, a, a decision rule or any type of research based information to a cohort that it wasn't studied in. So Jeff Klein is the biggest researcher in pulmonary embolism. And he came up with this perk rule. Um, so he's the biggest in the world, the biggest, the most, uh, prolific, uh, uh, uh publisher of, of pulmonary embolism literature. So it, this is to be applied in patients that have a low pretest probability, um, less than 15%. That one is always a weird one because there really isn't any explanation of how you get the 15% chance of, of the disease. But this is what they, they call like kind of a Bayesian logic where you, you have the pretest probability is X and then you apply these other decision rules and you get a post-test probability. And by getting all negative on the perk rule, you get it below 2%. How you get to 15%, that's really kind of a gestalt. It just basically means that you think that it's it's far more likely the person doesn't have a PE than they have a PE, but you still think they might have a PE. You don't want to put it on somebody that has zero chance of a PE. So say like an 18-year-old that doesn't have chest pain and doesn't have shortness of breath and doesn't have tachycardia. Like you don't need to apply a perk rule to that. <clears throat> so you're applying it to people that have some things, maybe some chest pain, some tachycardia, but they really don't have any risks that you can tell for PE. So you want to apply the perk rule. So it's really just eight questions that you ask. They have to be under the age of 50. Their heart rate has to be under 100 all the time. That means that they come in by EMS. You better look at the EMS records and make sure they didn't document 101. Same thing with uh, nursing. You know, nurses may be taking, they might be on the monitor or they may be taking vitals every hour or something like that. You got to make sure that, that they are indeed under 100 all the time. Same thing with the pulse ox of 94% or greater at sea level. That has to be everywhere it's noted on the chart. If it's anywhere below that, just like the heart rate, the perk rule does not apply. So they fail the perk rule. Um, no history of venous thromboembolism, no surgery in the last six weeks, no estrogen use. Uh, I put testosterone there just because testosterone is also a uh, a, um, causes the hypercoagulable state or can cause that. And it seems that these days, every male over 30 is on uh, TRT. So it's something to ask about. Um, it's not in the literature, so it's not like research proven, but I think it's something, if someone's on testosterone, I would not say they passed the perk rule. I'd say they failed, just like if, the, if a woman's on estrogen. Um, no coughing up blood and no unilateral leg swelling, which is just, you... you Put your hands on their legs and one they both seem about the same to you. You don't have to take out a tape measure. So commit that to memory and do that all the time when you're thinking you want to work up a PE. And if they pass that, then you're done. And that's really helpful. Let's move to the next slide. So this is our patient's chest x-ray. Uh, anybody want to venture a, a reading on this chest x-ray? If, if nobody does, I'll do it. Minnie, do you want to try it or Don? Okay. Not me, sorry, not me. Not Vinny, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so I look at the chest x-ray, I look at the costovertebral angles, they're really nice and sharp. 
You can see the ribs, you can see more than 10. You can see the heart is not enlarged. It's less than half the width of the thoracic cavity. You can see the spinous process as well. It doesn't look like there's any pneumonia anywhere. It looks like a totally normal chest X-ray to me. Yeah, it does look like a normal chest X-ray. Um, Saren hit all the points really. The the um, spinous processes. The, the the point of them is to uh, is to see that they are in the mid midpoint between the two heads of the clavicle. That that tells you that the X-ray is not rotated. And that looks if you see the two ends of the clavicles. You can point them out, Sharon. No, no, the proximal, uh, the yeah, proximal ends, right there. Yeah, and that one, and the spinous process is almost dead center. Uh, sometimes there, the the, the X ray is a little rotated, and that'll that'll obscure some things. So you'll see that the one clavicular head is is much closer to the spinous process. And as Sharon said, there's there's more than ten ribs, so it's a good inspiration. The heart is not, uh, you know, half the size of the of of uh, the hemithorax, the left hemithorax. So uh, it's not enlarged. Um, with uh, portable x-rays, I don't know for a fact if this one was portable or it probably is portable, but with portable x-rays, sometimes the heart can be, can look a little bit closer to half. So that, that marker of the heart being less than half the left hemithorax is for PA and lateral chest x-rays. So uh, portables sometimes will fool you with that. But this is a perfectly normal chest x-ray, which you can see in the disease process that this young lady had. Um, so she clearly had, um, you know, the, the the cardiac thing going on or the potential cardiac thing with the tachycardia and the chest pain, uh, but you're not seeing pneumonia, you're not seeing pneumothorax and, uh, um, uh, you know, her heart's not enlarged. So that's what you got here from this, uh, from this chest X-ray. Let's move to the next slide. This is uh, her EKG. I'll just give you a brief, um, a brief uh, review of how I do EKGs. I think it's good to get a, um, a system down uh, because in the ER, you have to be efficient and you want to look at the EKG. You don't want to look at it more than once. If you can look at the EKG and get all the information you need the first time you look at it, um, then if you're doing a follow-up EKG, it's much easier because you have in your head, you remember exactly, you're going to remember, trust me, exactly what you read. So something that changes on the follow-up is going to jump out at you. So have a system. Uh, you don't have to have my system. I'll just tell you my system because it works well for me. I always start at the bottom. They put the rhythm strip at the bottom. In this case, it's lead one. Um, most likely your leads are going to be two. And then second most likely is V1 for the rhythm strip. And the reason for that is that those leads are lying directly over the atria. So they give you the best picture of the uh, P wave. So <clears throat> in this one, I'll look at the, the, the rhythm strip first and I go for rate first. So you look to the center of this, just under the V3 and you'll see that there's a uh, an, R, uh, an R complex that's almost superimposed on a, a, a bold line. And if you go to the left, the first next bold line would be 300, the other way, the other way, yeah, 300 and 150 and then 100. The next bold line is 100. Go past the R. Yeah. So, I mean, you can do it either way, right? 300, 150, 100. I guess. I always go to the 300, 150, hey, I'm doing 100. my reading, okay? I'm doing okay. <laughs> 300, okay. 150, 100 to the left, okay? okay. So okay. that tells you that that complex is... Uh, not quite at the midpoint between 100 and 150. So it's less than 125, but it's pretty darn close. So, you know, it's probably something like 120 to 125 and her pulse was 122. So that's accurate. Um, so that's your rate. And then you look for your P waves and you want to see that there's a normal appearing P and that each P wave looks like the other P wave. So it's a single, uh, a single focus and that uh, each uh, QRS uh, complex is preceded by a P wave. So that tells you your rate and your rhythm. So clearly you've got a sinus tachycardia. Um, it's not AFib, it's not a flutter, it's not um, ventricular tachycardia or any of that stuff. So you've already got that hammered out. So you do your rate and rhythm first. And I go to... Um, I go to access next. So when I do access, I'm always looking at leads one and leads AVF. And 
it's the simple formula that if they're if the deflection is net positive or upward like an r wave in um one end avf that's a normal axis if it is um upright in one and and negative in avf that is a left axis and if it is negative in one and upright in avf that is a right axis and that's pretty much all you need to know about axis so we go with rate rhythm axis then i go with intervals I don't want to go over measure how you measure out all the intervals it's not an ekg course but uh normally the intervals are listed at the top of your ekg and although i caution people don't ever read the ekg reading first what i'm talking about there is don't read where it says something like anterior q waves or something like that um because it'll it'll bias you to looking at the at the ekg look at your ekg first then you and come up with your full reading then always review the computer read to see if there's something like it says acute mi and you didn't see it so that when you're documenting your ekg you can address your disagreement with the computer read or the computer read pointed out something you missed which is unlikely but maybe it did and you look at it again and say oh yeah crap that's true so be aware of that computer reading but don't read it right off the bat now I, I throw that part out with the intervals because the computer is generally spot on with intervals. They're generally even better than you are measuring them. So if you go up to the top left on EKGs, there's usually um, above the above the reading in that area that's white, there would usually be all the intervals. It'd be the PR interval, QRS, QTC interval. And you want to make sure that those are all normals. So all or normal. So make sure you know your normals on that. Um, and then after your intervals, so I've gotten now, whenever I do my my readings, I read, you know, I would, uh, let, okay, well, let's just finish it off. So the way I would finish is I'd go to um, hypertrophy, if there's any evidence of hypertrophy. Typically, you'll see left axis deviation with left hypertrophy and right axis deviation with right hypertrophy. But then you also have voltage criterion. And one of the voltage criterion is, 35 boxes in the uh, S wave of V2 and the R wave of V5 combined, or the S wave of V3 and the R wave of V6 combined. So if you look on these, there's more than 30, there's five in each box and there's almost seven in the V2 lead and there's a few more in the V5. So, so it's clearly over 35. And then V3, V6, I think is also over 35 as it's uh, one, two, yeah, it's going to be over 35. Um, so there's voltage criteria for hypertrophy. Then lastly, I go back to lead one. I read left to right um, for STT wave changes. So as you're going through this one, you see, oh, and you try to pay attention to the uh, anatomic leads. So one in AVL are called your high lateral leads. So in one in AVL in the ST segment, you see some subtle T wave inversions. Then I look at the inferior leads or the right coronary leads, two, three, and ABF. And you have one T wave inversion in two. Then you have a flat T wave in three and a flat T wave in uh, ABF. Three and ABF both have flat T waves. For T waves to be significant, they have to be in two consecutive leads. So the single T wave inversion in two is not really that significant with the non inverted three and ABF. Although I would say those are not completely normal T waves in three and AVF, so just make a note of that. Call that non-specific T wave changes there. Um, and then we'd move on to V1, V2, V3. So V1 and V2 are your septal leads. V2, V3, V4 are your anterior leads. And V5, V6 are your lateral leads. So if you look at uh, V1, you've got a... Um, there's, there's no uh, ST elevation or T-wave inversion. Same thing with V2, V3. Um, V4, we have what's called terminal T-wave inversion, where the T-wave inverts just at the tail end of it. And then V5, you have clear, deep T-wave inversion. Same thing with V6. So <clears throat> reading this EKG, I would come up with sinus tachycardia rate about 122, normal axis, normal intervals, voltage criterion for hypertrophy, deep S waves in the um, 
anterior leads and deep T wave inversions in the lateral leads, as well as some T wave inversions in the high lateral leads. So let's go to the next slide. So that's what this says. Basically, this is what she has. She has a sinus tach resting sinus tachycardia, those T wave inversions mentioned, and the deep S waves. Does anybody have any idea of anything we can be thinking about in this case with a person with chest pain, hypertension, tachycardia, and that EKG? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm kind of in and out. Yeah. All I mean, right. So, so he, what we got, Don? You got to be thinking. You know, is this early ischemia? Is this an acute coronary syndrome type picture? That's in there for sure. So it's a young lady. It's a young lady with no medical history that's got a significant resting sinus tachycardia. She's got uh, mild hypertension. She's got chest pain. And she has this EKG that has lateral T wave inversions and deep S waves and D1V3 with, with uh, voltage criterion for hypertrophy, resting tachycardia. Any, any other thoughts? I mean, it's not a simple, simple answer, but it's, 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 it's a good case and it's something that we see and it's something that can kill young people. So we need to, we need to be, be aware of it. We, uh, um, let's say we did a D dimer on her and the D dimer was negative, um, because she had, she didn't pass the perk rule cause she's tachycardic. So we'll say that we've ruled that out. D dimer is negative. So it's not a PE. Um, her troponins are negative. Let's say we get negative troponins. Um, let's say we get two negative troponins. So in a young person that has no medical history, no real risk factors, you've probably pretty much ruled out ACS. So it is a, it's not an arrhythmia. A any other thoughts? What was her TSH? Her TSH was normal. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's, let's Did you do a bedside go. ultrasound on her? Uh, I couldn't back then. It was like 1998 or something like that. But uh, yeah, you could do that now. So I'll just tell you that she returned to the ER seven times uh, over about six weeks. And her chief complaints varied from chest pain to vaginal bleeding. She had abdominal pain, chest pain, back pain, vaginal bleeding. Um, the one constant was that she was always tachycardic and always hypertensive. She was always re referred out for outpatient follow-up couple docs mentioned uh, echocardiogram. Um, she never got an echocardiogram done. As Sharon said, bedside ultrasound. Today, bedside ultrasound would have helped. Um, at her, uh, now, now, what happened when I first saw her, um, she was seen by a colleague of mine on day shift, and I came in for nights, and I, uh, I took the patient over at 11, and she'd had the normal TSH. She had the, the first troponin normal, um labs were normal nothing with her cbc or a bmp and uh the the doc before me curbside consulted our cardiologist which is something i would point out don't ever do um if you think the person's sick and you feel like you need an, an expert like uh a specialist opinion you know to help you uh do not curbside because not only is it not on the record and it's not official so you're you're not really covered as well People can argue that you never did curbside them. They don't remember that conversation. Not only all of that, but it also changes the, trust me, it changes the, um, what would you call it? Like the mentality of your consult. If they are thinking, I'm just being curbsided, I'm not actually, don't have a physician-patient relationship. I'm not seeing the patient, I'm not writing a note. Trust me, you know, they are going to, their, their mindset's just going to be different answering the question then if you physically consult them and they know that they have to develop a physician patient relation, they're on the hook, they're responsible, they're going to see the patient. It's very, very different. So without going too far on a tangent, don't curbside anybody. Like if you need to curbside somebody, like, I don't know, just for brevity's sake, I'll say for something simple, like I can't remember and I'm too lazy to look up what is the voltage criterion for hypertrophy. Uh, and my cardiologist is, working on a patient next to me i can say what's the voltage criterion of hyper if you want to get that kind of information from a cardiologist as a curbside that's fine um but 
or if you're not sure on the, the rapid rule out, although cardiologists may not know, it's really an ER thing. Cardiologists may not be aware of it. If you wanted to ask like, how, how many troponins should I get on this low risk chest pain? And you could ask something like that. But if you're like, I don't know, the CKG looks abnormal and this girl has chest pain, you better officially consult that, that person. So make sure you do that. So at least I, I feel good because this patient had a bad outcome um, that when I took her over, she fell asleep and her blood pressure went down to 110 over 60 and her and repeatedly, not just once. And her pulse rate stayed in the 50s and she had no chest pain, no abdominal pain, completely better. The, the curbside consult of the cardiologist said, get another troponin. If that's negative, she can go home and I can see her in my office. So she did have that negative troponin. And like I said, her vital signs normalized. So I sent her out, you know, to see her family doctor and, uh, you know, potentially called our, our, the cardiologist to get a follow up with the cardiologist. Um, she did see her family doctor multiple times as well as come back to the ER multiple times. A couple ER docs mentioned that she should probably get an echo as an outpatient. Her doctor tried to get her an echo, but um, I don't I don't know if she didn't have insurance or insurance wouldn't approve the echo. But um, unfortunately, they uh, they worried about the insurance thing. I mean, and on the seventh visit, she was hypoxic and she presented to the ER, you know, with chest pain, tachycardia, hypertension, hypoxic, and they did get the echocardiogram emergently. And it showed that she had a dilated cardiomyopathy, probably viral in nature. And unfortunately, within a 48 hours, she suffered a massive PE and died uh, in the unit. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So the vitals that you showed us with her having a 98% pulse ox and that nice clear chest x-ray that was prior to, she went downhill, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That was at her this, first at visit. This visit. She would have had an abnormal looking chest x-ray with a big probably. heart, right? And a positive uh, yeah. dimer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Probably would have been, um, and let me just. Forgot to mention that, like, it's most important, unfortunately, that the patient died. That's the tragedy. Um, but from a practitioner perspective, um, multiple docs were sued, including including myself. Uh, I was dropped out of the lawsuit, and I, I firmly believe I was dropped out of it because I had a normal chest X-ray, and I had um, uh, normal vital signs when she was discharged. Uh, my lawyer in deposition, you know, we made sure we pointed out that you know, she wasn't hypertensive and tachycardic on my shift. She was uh, 110 over 60 with a pulse rate of 55. Nobody would consider that that person had cardiomyopathy at that moment. Um, unfortunately, on the other visits to the ER, her vital signs never normalized. She was always tachycardic and hypertensive, like well tachycardic, like 130. Um, so clearly something was wrong with her and nobody was emergently addressing it. Um, so this is a former student of mine, and I asked his permission to keep his photo in my lectures, uh, which I don't think I told him I was going to keep it in every lecture I do, but I did say my lectures. So anyhow, <laughs> um, so I asked him, he had an asthma case, we had a bad asthma case, and, and I, I asked him, uh, you know, what are you going to do? It's a really serious asthma. What, what's, your, what, what's your game plan? What do, you, what, do you, what do you do? And he's like, well, I'll give her some, some nebs, like do a nebs and, uh, and uh, some steroids. And I was like, okay, we do that on almost all asthma patients, like if they need to be in the ER, but uh, this is a serious one. Like, what are the other things you do for the serious ones? You got to go another step. And he gave me that look. And I said, but anyhow, um, if I have a lecture on crashing asthmatic that we might do here on the virtual series. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't want to be that guy, which means that really for all your presentations, whether it's abdominal pain, back pain, headache, shortness of breath, you know, neurologic complaints, you want to have a game plan. You want to have an approach. You want to know, you know, what are my red flags? What are the things I have to keep an eye out for um, to make sure I don't miss? And you want to look at vital signs right off the bat and make sure that you understand their vital signs and that you you follow down those abnormal vital signs like like a good detective until you you find out what's causing them. So let's go to the next slide. So in summary, um, vital signs are vital. Emergency medicine is hard. Remember, number one, get the vital signs early. 
um, I, I try to get them first. I try to look at them before I, before I even talk to the patient, I want to make sure I know their bottle signs because it'll really key you in as if there's, there's, you know, you've got to make sure, you know, abnormals, if they're, this per patient has got abnormal bottle signs, don't accept partial vital signs. It still happens to me that you can go a couple hours in on somebody and realize that, uh, you know what, I never saw a temperature on that person. Um, you got to make sure you have a full set of bottle signs. I'll tell you, you'll do yourself a huge favor if you make sure you are aware of a full set of bottle signs and everybody as soon as you possibly can. Try to get it before you even see the patient. Pain is not the fifth vital sign. The pain scale is not going to help you. Like I said, it's my life mission to eradicate this from our ER charts. I did have a I did have a lady the other day. I just thought it was a funny story because she brought her like three year old in for an earache, and I was just asking questions about what's what's happening. You know, like when did it start? And she just goes like, Johnny, what is your ear pain on a scale of one to ten? I believe like even just like regular patients are now using the pain scale on their three year olds. It's just absurd. Anyhow, um, if you uh, can't get a, an automated pressure, which most people in, that are put on monitors are put on an automated pressure cuff, um, if you can't get one, which oftentimes you can't when they're very hypertensive or very hypotensive, uh, get a manual. Um, oftentimes the nurses, they're preoccupied with you know, asking the pain scale or making sure that they have their COVID vaccination or their flu vaccination or their tetanus vaccination or any other vaccination that Big Pharma can cash in on. Um, asking if they're safe at home when they're not having a heart attack. Um, they're asking all those important questions that uh, the Joint Commission has insisted that they have to get on the chart because they're completely useless and unhelpful. Um, and they're not getting a blood pressure because they're tied up with that or doing a lot. So get that manual pressure. If the nurses can't get a manual pressure, get it yourself. And lastly, don't discharge anyone from the ER with an abnormal vital sign unless you have a, a very good reason as to why it's benign. Um, I'll just go with a simple example here for brevity's sake, but <clears throat> if you take a, a chronic COPD or well, I guess COPD is chronic, that's a, that's whatever you call it, uh, double positive. Anyhow, so you've got a COPD or whose pulse sox is 83% on room air and goes up to 90, 91% on two liters and they normally use two liters at home. And you walk them around on their two liters and they say they feel fine. This is what they feel like at home. Um, in fact, they maybe they get out of breath walking to the bathroom on their two liters, but then they tell you, yeah, I get out of breath whenever I walk this far at home. I can only make it X far. So you've just established that even though that vital sign is abnormal, for this patient, that vital sign is baseline. That's normal. And you'd have to document that on the chart. Make sure that that's clear. Um, you want to make sure that if there's an abnormal vital sign and you're sending them home, that it's definitely a benign abnormal vital sign. Um, and then one last thing I'd like to say is that um, as much as I'm, the whole point of this lecture is that vital signs are vital and focus on them and make sure you know them. Um, vital signs are not like in granite. They're not carved in stone, just like uh, like that person um, with the abnormal uh, pulse ox. Um, I've had nurses, you know, that are just demanding that we have to do something. The pulse ox is 83% of Romero. That you really have to, to clarify that yeah, that this is his normal. He, he absolutely says he feels fine. Like he has to use his oxygen. He uses oxygen all the time. He's never without it. Um, you just have to, you look at the whole picture as well. Um, if you have like a slight tachycardia, like 102, 103, and the person admits that they're very anxious and they always get anxious when they go to the doctor and you've checked out other things like uh, anemia and acidemia and all that other stuff and they don't have it, it's not arrhythmia. Um, you know, anxiety is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. It's your last thing after you've ruled everything out. But, you know, if the patient does seem anxious, like sometimes with an anxious patient that's tachycardic, if they're going to get a workup, I'll give them an anxiolytic, like a little bit of Valium or a little bit of Ativan IV. And if it is anxiety, usually the heart rate will go down. Um, so that's uh, something, you know, to keep in mind that if you give some Ativan and they're kind of chilling out or fell asleep and they're still 101 that's very different than if you gave them some out of van they fall asleep and their pulse goes down to 70. um so that's pretty much it unless anyone has any any other questions or anything got a little bit of time for questions if you have any